Thank you very much, Sabrina. She just gave my lecture. So uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> my race needs no special defense for the past history of them proves them to be of equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. That is on Robert Small's tombstone in Buford, North, South Carolina. And so he was an amazing individual as we all look through the history books and understand. It, his escape all began as a joke, as one story goes about Robert Smalls. All the white officers of the CSS planter had gone ashore and several enslaved black crew members were kidding around in the pilot house. One sailor put the ship's commander, Captain Rila's hat on Smalls, which prompted him to fold his arms across his check and walk with a jaunty step just like the captain. Everyone laughed hysterically as Small looked somewhat like the captain. Both men were short and muscular with a wide brim straw hat pulled down over his forehead. Smalls could easily pass for the white officer from a distance. Smalls increased, uh, uncrossed his arms thoughtfully. The impersonation that he made that day tripped an exciting idea. If he had the courage, he might gain his freedom and strike a blow for the Union as well. As he removed the captain's hat, that same moment, Smalls started to work out a scheme for stealing the planter. Robert Smalls, as we know, was born in Buford, South Carolina on 5 April 1839 to Lydia uh, Polite. And it was, she was a woman enslaved by Henry McKee. He grew up on the influence of his mother's low country Gullah culture. Lydia worked within the McKee's house, but had grown up working in the fields. Robert appeared to be favored by McKee and he grew up in the house, but his mother had him work in the fields to help him understand the plight of most enslaved workers, including watching punishments and so forth. <clears throat> At the age of 12, Smalls moved to Charleston. He was rented out, which was a common practice during that time period, and he was rented out to a hotel. He received actually $8 a week, but he only got $1 of that, the other seven going to his owner, James McKee. So then he, uh, after, after working in the hotel, he worked as a lamplighter, a longshoreman, a rigger, a sailmaker. His love of the docks and water environs soon landed him a position as a wheelman. Now, actually, we use the term wheelman instead of helmsman and pilot, because at that time, uh, during uh, slavery, African-Americans could not hold certain positions. So that was a symbol of prejudice. Yet <clears throat> he was a much sought after pilot. And so he actually got married at age 17 to Hannah Jones. She was in a hotel, uh, enslaved hotel maid, five years older than Robert and had two daughters. Small intended to purchase their freedom. However, by 1861, he had only managed to save $100 of the $800 asking price. Um, so when Fort Sumner was captured, Robert Smalls was detailed uh, to helm the CSS planner. In other words, his Mr. McKee received his wages as a, as working as a wheelman, but he's really the pilot of the vessel. And so this was a very typical practice. In fact, we talk a lot about um, African-Americans in the Confederate service. Many of them were actually more support staff, cooks and so forth. And actually many company commanders would bring their enslaved people with them. Why? Because they would enlist them in the company and would receive their pay, believe it or not. So it's a, a sad story, which we're not going to go into too much today, but nevertheless, it's one we should recognize. The planter was a 140 foot long side wheeler built in Charleston by John Ferguson. 
And John Ferguson, it was built in 1860. It was an extremely fast vessel, 14 knots, and he leased it to the Confederacy for $125. What made the planter, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> what made the planter so successful was that it was extremely shallow draft, six feet. Now, when you start to think about that draft, that means it can go all over Charleston Harbor. Charleston Harbor has three you know, channels coming in, but it has a lot of shoal, just like Hampton Roads would have. So the steamer uh, was armed with one 32-pounder gun and another 24-pounder howitzer, and that 32-pounder is what's called a shell gun. And it was the flagship of Charleston's second district commander, Brigadier General Roswell Ripley. And Ripley was a West Point graduate, and he fought in the Mexican War. He was a publisher. He wrote books, uh, and he married a wealthy willa, widow when he was stationed at Fort uh, Moultrie. And as a result of that, he retired from the Army and became a businessman. So that was pretty good for him, but he commanded um, Fort Moultrie during the bombardment of Charleston. Now, this is the only known photograph of the planter. And uh, so here we are looking at, I'm gonna come back to that one. <clears throat> Here's we're looking at Charleston Harbor. And what's important, you see all the notations of the draft and the channels and so forth. As a result of that, you know, the plant, that's what made the planner such a valued um, gunboat, flagship, so forth. Now, I have to tell you that uh, the duty of the planter was to transport uh, soldiers and supplies to various forts. And you see all those daggum forts that are built to defend uh, basically Charleston Harbor. It actually has a three ring of defenses. So some of them are pre-war such as Fort Johnson and Fort Moultrie and Castle Pitney and of course, Fort Sumter. And the rest were built in prior to the bombardment of Sumter. So, um, you know, delivering dispatches, uh, Smalls piloted throughout Charleston Harbor and regional rivers up and down the coast from South Carolina to Florida. During every mission, Smalls and his fellow enslaved crew members would look out and see the federal blockaders, which are right around here, okay? Uh, and so they saw them and they recognized they were freedom. And so basically, he then started to make that plan for escape. Remember, he thought about it when he put on that hat? Well, now he knew how he was going to execute it. Now, it just so happens on May 12th, 1862, the planter steamed 10 miles west of Charleston to help dismantle a Confederate fort at... Uh, Coles Island. See right there. The Confederates were reducing their forts. Uh, and so Planter, uh, along with the Planter's crew and Smalls, would help to dismantle the fort, as well as carrying four heavy cannon um, away from the fort back into Charleston. Now, um, the, the, these heavy cannon were amazing. They were actually um, 10 pounder uh, or 10 inch Columbiads, which were pre-war guns. And so this plays a big significant amount of importance. They go back to Roswell's uh, dock and they add 20, 200 pounds of ammunition and some food and 20 cords of firewood. Because I got to tell you, the planter didn't use coal, it used wood. Because is coal in great supply in Charleston? The answer is no. So it's a really regional vessel. So um, it, every night, Captain Charles C.J. Rhea, uh, a graduate of the Citadel, uh, would um, actually disembark to spend the night ashore. He and his fellow officers would go to dances and so forth and slept in better accommodations than could be found on the planner. So on the evening of May 12th, once again, Rhea, is going to leave. And it just so happens that um, 
And Smalls asked him, well, do you mind if our families come on board, you know, which was a common practice. And Rhea said, sure, why not? And just make sure they're gone by curfew. Oh, well. So what's going to transpire is, is that the families come on and guess what? Smalls. Now, there are nine crew members other than Smalls. This is a small ship, 140 feet in length. There was one that Smalls did not trust, but finally they held him uh, and they uh, actually Smalls, when these children and wives come on board, they, uh, they say, well, we're gonna run away tonight. We're going to escape. And they all howl and scream, oh, we can't. However, um, you know, as, his, as Hannah, his wife said that when told of the plan, it is a risk, dear, but you and I and our little ones must be free. I will go for where you die, I will die. And all of a sudden, all those families recognized this was their tremendous chance to achieve freedom. Three, now curfew's coming. So three crew members are going to escort the families. However, they got off the planter and as the soon shrouded by darkness, they turn around and go to another steamer docked at the North Atlantic Wharf. And at 3 a.m., Smalls put on Captain Rila's uniform and straw hat and left the wharf below General Ripley's headquarters. They passed the Southern Wharf and their families, and they picked up their families from the North uh, Atlantic um, uh, dock. So what you have to do basically is Smalls is gonna have to uh, come to these various docks, right? Then he's going to have to pass what? Huh, you know, Castle Pickney. Uh, he's within range of Fort Moultrie, Battery Walner, uh, White Point Gardens Battery. So this is a dangerous trip, a daring trip beyond all compare. But Smalls knew if he kept, kept to his plan, all would be well. So, you know, once he puts on the straw hat and picks up the families at North Atlantic Wharf, Smalls then copied Rhea's, uh, Rhea's mannerisms. The planter had successfully passed several forts and reached Fort Sumter, oh my gosh, right there at about 4.30. Fort Sumter was the most heavily armed of all forts in the Charleston Harbor. It was the key to the defense of Char Charleston Harbor. Now, what does Smalls have? He has the signal boat. He's been used to being next to the captain as helmsman as they pass various forts and they flash certain signals. So despite being illiterate at the time, he understood those signals. And so, uh, of course, as they pass near Fort Sumter, all the other crew members said, oh, let's take a wide berth. Let's, you know, let's not risk it. Those guns can blow us out of the water. They knew they were at risk. But Small says, oh, no, if we, as he said, we, when we drew near the fort, every man but Robert Smalls felt his knees give away, and the women began crying and praying again. Praying again. As the planter approached the fort, you know, they urged him to move away. However, he said that will cause suspicion. And as a result of it, he speared the ship along its normal path. Now you can see uh, the channel markings, right? So he's going out here and the Maffet channel. And so um, he then steered along the normal path and then, and he actually slowed the ship down to act like he was in no hurry. He flashed the signals to Fort Sumter, and then there was a pause. Everyone feared, right, that the, the fort may not recognize him, may see that Smalls was not Rhea. And so as a result of that, moments of great fear passed, and then all of a sudden, Fort Sumter flashed the signals and they steamed out. However, instead of going to um, Morris Island right here, as you would expect them to do, guess what? They head out towards the Union fleet. 
And by the time they make that turn, they are out of the range of the Confederate artillery and the fort's kind of upset. Um, and so what happens is Hannah Smalls had brought with her a bed sheet, right? So as soon as they pass out of the inner harbor, the outer harbor, they take down the disgusting rebel rag, as they called it, and they put up this bed sheet. Well, they're heading straight to the blockaders. Now, a boat coming out of Charleston heading straight to the blockaders. What do you think it might be? A blockade runner, a Confederate ship. So they are worried because they're facing towards what is known as the USS Onward, which was a purchased vessel armed at that time uh, by eight 32 pounder shell guns. In other words, they can blow the planter out of the water. The commander of the Onward was um, Lieutenant John Frederick Nichols, and he prepared to fire on the planter. This is really pretty serious at stuff because they certainly had the firepower to blow it out of the water. Now, I got to tell you, there was no real breeze to the flat, the, the bed sheet was hanging limp on the flagstaff. So Smalls turns the planter in a way that that bed sheet unfurls, you know. Now, Nichols will later recount in the official records, just as the number three port gun was being prepared to fire, a shout came from the crew, I see something that looks like a white flag. As she neared us, there was a rush of contrabands out on her deck, some dancing, some singing, some whistling, jumping. Others stood looking towards Fort Sumner, muttering and shaking their fists, all sorts of depreciations against it and the Confederacy. As the planter laid alongside the onward, Robert Small stepped forward, taking off his hat and shouted, good morning, sir. I have brought you some of the old United States guns, sir. You know, in other words, not only did the planter contain not only the two guns that are mounted on the deck, but also four 10-inch Columbiads. Uh, these are heavy guns that are really critical in naval warfare and coastal defense. So, but what else does he have? He has the Confederate code book. He has maps of where he had laid the torpedoes defending the harbor. And he also has descriptions of the forts, their ranges. In other words, they, the Confederates had planned how to have, you know, direct and indirect covering fire. So any boat trying to come in the main channel or the Maffet channel and so forth, they would have a being fired from both sides. Okay, so that is means we're dangerous. So, Smalls has all that information, and he then also tells Nichols that, oh my gosh, we took these guns from Coles Island, remember? Uh, we're going to come back to this map a couple of times, but um, anyway, so, and, he's, and the Federals immediately, Nichols reports to his commander, and that, uh, which went up to Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont, who is then commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, and he is not the rich DuPonts. He is, his, his father was a uh, brother to the real rich DuPonts. However, DuPont was not dumb, and he married his first cousin, who was from the rich DuPonts. So, you know, that's the DuPont story. Uh, anyway, so the Union would quickly occupy Coles Island, which gives them this tremendous position, starting to really be able to, you know, break the defenses of Fort Sumter. Now, Flag Officer DuPont met Smalls and wrote Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, noting Robert, the intelligent slave and pilot of the boat, who performed this bold feat so skillfully. DuPont also noted that Smalls is superior to any who have come into our lines, intelligent as many of them has been. So Smalls, remember he's illiterate, but still he has this brilliance about him. Opportunities just did not give him that chance. So I gotta tell you, 
Smalls is 23 years old when this happens. And uh, he became a hero throughout the North, lauded by Boston and New York newspapers as the, as they would call him, the intelligent slave that tricked the Confederacy and brought the ship into freedom. That was a big deal. So what does US Congress do? Well, they do the unthinkable. They offer prize money to Smalls. Now that would not be typically done to an African-American at that time. But uh, so Smalls receives $1,500. You know, they had prize courts. In other words, they would adjudicate the value of the boat and then everyone who captured it, including the squadron commander on down would get a cut of the prize money. And if you were a naval officer, you could make some money when you captured a blockade runner or so forth. People don't all realize that, but it was pretty tremendous. So, um, so Smalls receives that. His crew members also, depending on what they were, firemen, uh, ordinary uh, seamen, they would get a certain cut. Now, the North were dying to have Smalls come north just to see this man who had tricked the Confederacy. DuPont says, oh no, we need him here in South Carolina to support Union operations. Major General David Hunter. Now, David Hunter is a graduate of West Point, class of uh, 1822, and uh, he is known as Black Dave because even at age 60, he has coal black hair. We all believe he used shoot bl shoe black to you know, color his hair. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's just what some of them did. But anyway, he, because he had served in Kansas prior to the war, he had become an ardent abolitionist. In fact, when he was in command of the uh, District of South Carolina, uh, he would actually issue his own Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln says, oh, no, you can't do that. He then wanted to actually recruit African-Americans, freemen. Now, remember, when the Union captured Port Royal Sound, this is the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia, where they grow a certain type of cotton, the finest cotton. And so it was a, a large amount of freemen's. Uh, I think in a prior lecture, I talked about the Port Royal experiment. So as soon as Port Royal was captured, um, abolitionists and educators a part of the American Missionary Association came down and set up schools and so forth. So this is a uh, pretty big, uh, but David Hunter, uh, you know, Lincoln says, yeah, you know, I'm in charge, not you. So you can't recruit those soldiers. Yeah, can't emancipate them. So anyway, he said, well, no, Robert Smalls can go to Washington. And in August of 1862, Smalls went with American Missionary Association minister Mansfield French, who was one of the leaders with the Port Royal experiment. And French and Smalls wanted to convince President Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to start to recruit African-American soldiers. They did not meet with Lincoln, but they did meet with Edwin Stanton. And he agreed and ordered that 5,000 formerly enslaved contrabands be able to enlist in what was known as the 1st and 2nd South Carolina Regiment, in parentheses afterwards, colored. These would later become the 33rd United States Colored Troops on 8 February 1862. But this was a chance. What made that so important, which Hunter understood, Smalls understood, that those newly freed people, just beginning to learn how to read and write, had this opportunity to rise against their oppressors and fight for the freedom of their brethren. That is really creative. Create critical and Smalls recognize that in the truest way. So when he comes back to South Carolina, he went into service. Uh, he took the planter down near Fort Pulaski uh, outside of Savannah. Smalls was then made pilot of the Crusader because the planter needed some repairs. This screw steamer was armed with seven guns and captained by Commander Alexander Rhine. 
when the planter returned to service, Smalls was transferred back to the planter. However, Ryan would never forget him. Uh, because Smalls served in such engagements like the Battle of Simeon's Bluff, where he became, where he proved his bravery, proved his skills as a pilot. And so, wow, you know, he, he's this outstanding individual. So Ryan, when he takes command of the, whoopsie doodle, uh, the Keokuk, uh, he will ask Smalls to be the pilot of the Keokuk. Now, the Keokuk is a bad idea, I have to tell you. It's a tower, uh, ironclad. In other words, those are not turrets. Those are fixed towers that only had one 11-inch Dahlgren shell gun in each one. So it has limited firepower, limited fire control, and it was protected by two and a half inches of iron backed by rubber and wood. So that's not going to work very well because during DuPont's attack on Charleston, uh, basically this ship will be hit 96 times from the guns of Fort Sumter. Now, I got to tell you, if you're an ironclad with not good armor, what's going to happen? You are going to sink. And barely the Kea Cook got outside of the harbor where she went down and uh, once again, that design created by Charles Whitney, a former partner of John Erickson, was a failure. Oh my gosh. So what happened is that there's going to be a change of command, both with the commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Uh, DuPont will be replaced by uh, Rear Admiral John uh, DuPont and, uh, or excuse me, John Dahlgren. And um, Hunter will be replaced by Major General Quincy Adams Gilmore. What a name. And uh, so you told your political thoughts when you named your child. So, you know, he, they were a Whig. And so anyway, now he, Gilmore, who was the guy who captured Fort Pulaski in uh, um, April of 1862, is a great hero. He then takes Smalls and transfers him to the U.S. Army Quartermaster Department. He then briefly served on the Isaac Smith, which was a supply vessel. However, when the Union Army occupied the south end of Morris Island, right down here, uh, that Smalls will be named the Lighthouse Pilot. So that is a really high honor for him. So, but Smalls didn't want to be a lighthouse pilot, right? And so on December 1st, 1863, Smalls was back piloting the planter. The steamer then com was commanded by a man known as Lieutenant James Nicholson. Nicholson. Now, he is what's called an acting lieutenant. Now, back in the Navy, they had need so many new officers because of the expansion of the Navy they would take in some civilians that served on ships. And this man was a former merchant man commander. So anyway, uh, the steamer was then, uh, of course, going up Folly Island Creek when the Confederate batteries at Secessionville, that's right, they changed the name of the town to Secessionville in South Carolina. And Nickerson, when the guns start firing from the shore, Nickerson is seized with such terrible panic. What does he do? He runs down into the coal bunkers and cowers, right? Now, Smalls knows immediately, oh my gosh, if this ship is damaged, if this ship is captured, myself and my fellow former enslaved crew members are going to be either killed or more probably returned to slavery. So Smalls refused to surrender, and then he took over command of the ship, and he turned it around under fire and basically guided it to safety. Purportedly, when he returns to um, Morris Island with the planter, uh, Gilmore will be so impressed with his service that he promotes him to captain 
of the 33rd USCT. Wow, there's no African-American officers in the Navy during the Civil War, although there are lots of African-Americans that did serve in the Navy. We estimate pre-war, there were about 10%. During the war, up to 20 to 25%. In fact, there's some ships like the USS Hunchback that 60% of the crew were what? African-Americans, newly freed African-Americans, I wanna say. So at this point of, of fame, Smalls was voted an unofficial delegate to the Republican National Convention in Baltimore. He steams the planter up to Baltimore. And then afterwards, now he's the first African-American to attend a Republican National Convention. Uh, this, this is just showing that Smalls not only was successful one day in gaining freedom, that he continued rising up the ladder to prove himself equal to anyone. Afterwards, he took the planter to Philadelphia for repairs at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. While in the city, Smalls hired a tutor and he learns the basics of reading and writing. So, uh, but <clears throat> despite his heroism and fame, and everyone knows who Robert Smalls is, he's on a streetcar in Philadelphia and he is sitting in a seat and a white man comes on board and he orders Smalls to get out of the way. Instead of conceding to his commands at the next stop, Smalls gets off the streetcar. But this is hits the front page of the Philadelphia newspapers. And in 1867, the Pennsylvania legislature integrates all public transport in the state. Wow. You know, you think about that, that was a major step. And it's all thanks to Smalls. Smalls took the planter down uh, to support General William T. Sherman's, or William Tecumseh Sherman, as I like to say, uh, capture of that city. He returned with the planter to Charleston Harbor for the 14 April raising of the original U.S. flag that flew over Fort Sumter four years before. The flag was raised by Major General Robert Anderson, who had commanded the fort when it was bombarded and captured by the Confederates in, when was it? April 14th, 1861. See the sim symbolism of this. And, and Anderson had taken down the flag and hidden it in his jacket, you know, so he could knew come back one day and raise it over that battered fortification. Now, what Smalls did, this is a tremendous symbol of what's happening. The war is nearing conclusion. We've already had the Emancipation Proclamation. We already understand that freedom is something that is deserved by all Americans, including African-Americans. And so as a result of that, he takes hundreds of freedmen out to Fort Sumter to witness this flag raising, which is symbolic of the end of the war, symbolic of freedom for all. Now, Smalls was discharged, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, on uh, 11 June, 1865. However, he continued to move supplies and food to the Port Royal colony of freedmen. Uh, he then will have the planter join the service of the Freedmen's Bureau, which is trying to give education and acclimate these former enslaved people into regular society. Well, now uh, there are some questions that start to come up after the war and that will continue for several years after the war. Smalls was never formally commissioned into the US Navy. Major General Quincy Adams Gilmore gave him commission. However, first as a second lieutenant, and then promoted him uh, because of the engagement near Secessionville into a captain, detailed to serve as a pilot. Now his salary at that time was $1,800 
which is equal to the salary of a captain in the US Navy, right? But he couldn't be in the Navy because he was African-American. Small uh, Gilmore put him into a you know, USCT unit. However, his status is never confirmed because the commission given to him by Gilmore, Smalls had lost. And so he has to fight for a pension which after a special act of Congress in 1897, he will receive a pension equal to that of a Navy captain, $30 a month. Just think about living on that today, you know? <laughs> uh, so now they then all of a sudden figure out that Smalls and the crew members had been cheated and they have been cheated because of the low evalu evaluation of the value of the planter. So they increase the value to $60,000, um, and this is in 1883, and Small's share would be $5,000. However, instead of giving them all the $5,000, said, well, we already gave you $1,500, so we're only gonna give you now $3,500. But that was good for Small's. After the war, Small's returns to Buford, South Carolina, and uh, let me get caught up here. I always forget about my slides, you know. Um, I don't know why. But anyway, this is the McKee Smalls House. I've been there. It's in Buford, South Carolina. You can visit too. In fact, it's an awesome experience in my opinion. Now, he purchased the McKee House. His former enslaver, McKee, is angry because he had lost the house due to taxes. And of course, when the Union occupied Buford, McKee leaves and they start charging taxes for the union and he doesn't pay. And so guess what happens? He loses the house. McKee sues to get his house back. However, Smalls is successful in retaining the house. I gotta tell you right now, Smalls is a unique individual because not only does he make sure his mother, Lydia, gets to live in this house with his family, he also allows Mrs. Jane McKee, the wife of his enslaver, to come and stay in the house as she grew older and finally perished. So that is, that's a statement to the character, I gotta say, of Robert Smalls. So anyway, Smalls also purchased the Beaumont uh, building, a two-story building, which he turns into a school for African-Americans. Now, Smalls learned rudimentary reading and writing. However, he creates a school and hires tutors for the school uh, so that he also can get intensive education to expand his ability, uh, not only to speak and to read, but also to become a unique leader in his community. So uh, that building, the Beaumont building, is still standing also, which you can visit, uh, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and so, so after that, he opens a store for African-Americans in Buford using the help of Philadelphia businessman, Richard Cleves, and the store serves the needs of Freeman. He also creates an 18 mile horse drawn railway to move goods from Charleston to interior depots. And, and so he becomes a leading businessman. He also opened a, and published the newspaper Beaufort, Buford, excuse me, yeah, North Carolina's Beaufort, South Carolina's Buford. And I, you know, I know both places and the rush of talking, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, the Buford Southern Standard opened in 1872 and remained being published until his death. He becomes a Republican politician. In 1868, he is with the South Carolina Constitutional Convention. In 1868, he's also elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives. In 1870, he is elected to the South Carolina Senate. Now, in 1872, he becomes a delegate to the Republican National Convention, where they nominated Grant for a second term. So that's pretty awesome. In 1873, he had been appointed Lieutenant Colonel of the 3rd Regiment, 
South Carolina State Militia, eventually becomes a major general of the second division of the South Carolina State Militia until 1877. And I got to tell you that date, 1877, is critical because that's when reconstructed reconstruction ended. So Smalls is still going to try and rise in this environment. He is a strong debater and speaker. So he actually served in the House of Representatives for five different terms. And afterwards, you know, he will actually uh, become part, uh, will be named the Custom Inspectors uh, Inspector uh, for Bu the Port of Buford, South Carolina. So I got to tell you, he attends the 1895 South Carolina State Constitutional Convention. He fought it very hard because it is the convention that established Jim Crow laws and disenfranchised African Americans. You know, uh, I have to tell you that Smalls will um, continue living until February 23rd. 1915, he has diabetes and he dies from malaria, which was still a terrible disease. As he said in 1912, I never lost sight of the fact that had it not been for a Republican Party, I would never have been an office holder of any kind from 1862 to the present. He described the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln, which unshackled the necks of four million human beings. My race needs no special defense for the past history of them proves them to be an equal of any people anywhere. And so, you know, Smalls kept fighting for that equality for his entire life, beginning with that effort when he's living in Charleston to purchase his freedom. Then it is finding his freedom with the escape of the uh, um, CSS planter and becoming the USS planter. Uh, and during his post-war life, he served not just African-Americans, but the entire cons people of South Carolina and the nation with equality and in a manner that showed his wisdom and fairness. Robert Smalls is a person that we should all remember today as he is a symbol of how you rise up from the shackles of slavery or shackles of being poor and become a leader in your community that is a shining light for all people to follow. Thank you.